We've been talking about a lot of interesting topics, so it's about time we mentioned shader programming. Your CPU handling commands is just one way of getting things done. But when it comes to computer games, movie effects, or even AI, there's another piece of hardware we need to talk about. The GPU. Every second, your screen is drawing millions and millions of pixels, many times per second. CPUs aren't built for that kind of work, but GPUs are, because by design, they run thousands of tasks simultaneously. Today, we are going to focus on one specific part of GPU programming, the pixel shader, also called a fragment shader. It's a small program that runs for every single pixel, deciding what color it should have, how it should look. To keep things simple, we won't use any low-level 3D APIs like Direct3D, OpenGL, or Vulkan yet, because those require a lot of setup. We'll get into those in future videos. For now, let's just focus on the principles. A great way to start experimenting with Pixel Shader is by using Shader Toy. It was created by these two guys, and the best part is it runs right in your browser. No installations, no setup, just open it and start coding. So, Let's jump in and see what shader programming is all about. Hi, I'm Pavel, I work in game development and I'm a former graphics developer and researcher with a PhD in computer science. Today's topic is computer graphics, so if you like this type of content, don't forget to check out the linked playlist for more. Open Shader Toy, click New, and take a look at the sample program. The entry point is a function called main image, which has two parameters. The first is frag color, marked as out, which represents the final color of the pixel being processed. The second is frag chord, marked as in, which contains the coordinates of the pixel input parameter. Shader Toy provides several built-in constants you can use, which you'll find under shader input. The most important ones for now are eye resolution, which is the resolution of the scene, and eye time, which is simply a timer. A common first step is to normalize the pixel coordinates so they are on the scale from 0 to 1. These normalized coordinates are called UV coordinates and they make things easy because we don't need to worry about the actual screen resolution. For example, the point 0 0.5, 0 0.5 will always represent the center, no matter the resolution. Let's replace call with this new line and click compile. Notice what happens. The UV variable is a vector, which means it's a vector with two elements and we can access them as X and Y. The bottom left corner corresponds to 0, 0, which appears as black. And the top right corner is 1, 1, which shows as yellow. You can also see how call is used as the final pixel color. Before we continue, let's quickly go over where pixel shaders fit into the graphics rendering pipeline. In nutshell, the pipeline is made up of several stages. Vertex processing figures out where the geometry will appear on the screen. Rasterization turns those geometric shapes into pixel fragments. And fragment processing, this is where our pixel shaders do their work. Finally, is output merging, which combines everything into the final image. Pixel shaders take in information about each pixel, such its coordinates, and output a final color value. This little program runs once for every single pixel that needs to be drawn, which can easily mean millions of times per frame. In real-world rendering, we are usually drawing the pixels of 3D models made up of triangles, so pixels of triangles. But here, what we are working with is just the full screen effect. Technically, it's still two triangles filling the entire screen, but there's no actual 3D model involved. So what do you think this shader is doing? Right now, it's just spitting out solid red color. The frag color is set red, and that's it. The last component here is the alpha value, which just makes it fully visible. When I compile it, surprise, surprise, I get a flat red screen. No magic here, because I'm not even using the pixel's position or any UV coordinates yet. But let's spice things up. What if we want to draw something, say an ellipse? All right, here's what's going on. I'm calculating the UV coordinates just like before, but now I'm centering them around 0, 0. Why? Well, because it makes the math way more intuitive. Zero, zero is right in the middle of the screen, which is perfect for creating shapes. I'm building this ellipse using the step function. Uh, quick pause. What's the step function in GLSL? 
Basically, it's simple threshold. It outputs zero if the value is below a certain edge and one if it's above. Perfect for sharp edges. Here, I'm using distance for it and <laughs> there it is. We got ourselves an ellipse. It's cool, but let's tweak it. First, I can turn this into a perfect circle. How? By fixing the aspect ratio. Right now, if your screen is wider or taller, the circle looks squished, right? As, as ellipse. By scaling the X coordinate by the screen's width to height ratio, it stays perfectly round, no material resolution. Second, I can swap step for smooth step. It gives us soft anti aliased edges. Instead of a harsh outline, we get a nice smooth gradient around the circle. Much prettier, right? Now let's make things move. We'll animate the circle radius using a sine wave. If you know how sine behaves, it oscillates up, down, up, again. That's perfect for pulsating effect. So the radius grows and shrinks over time, and I'm also adding a color shift, again using sine as a function of time. The result? A glowing, pulsating circle. It almost feels alive. And all right, the last one. And this is just for the math lovers out there. This is a shader powered by pure trigonometry. Here, I'm not normalizing the coordinates, so things look a little stretched, but stick with me. I'm using arc tangent on the UV coordinates to get the angle and length, which is Pythagoras in action, to get the radius. Then, by incrementing the angle with time, the whole thing rotates. The stripes you are seeing, they come from sine angle times 8 times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5, which creates repeating radial patterns. Let's break this down visually. I plot sine x times 8 times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 in Google. If I offset it by 0 0.6 and scale it by 0 0.3, the amplitude changes and we can control how bright or dark the pattern gets. Increasing the frequency, say multiplying by 4, changes number of repetitions in 2pi thus changing number of stripes. Back in the shader, uh, these changes directly affect how many leaves or rays we see and how bright they get. Uh, by tweaking these numbers, we can go from subtle patterns to bold dynamic visuals. In the end, this is where math meets art. By combining simple functions and smooth step, you can turn abstract formulas into animated visuals. Uh, shaders make math look cool. And that's it for the introduction. Now, it's your turn. Try it out for yourself, or play around, experiment, plug in formulas you already know, or just make something up, and see how the math comes to life on the screen. As we saw earlier, you can get really creative, sometimes even a little wild, when you mix pure mathematics with shaders. Shader programming is very different from classic programming. It feels more abstract. Remember, every single line you write here runs on every pixel on the screen, so efficiency matters. Don't waste resources, you'll thank yourself later. In real-world projects, we don't usually use pixel shaders just to draw shapes or run full-screen effects all the time. More often, they are used for things like working with materials, mapping textures and computing lightning, and we'll explore all of that in future. That's all for today. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this and want to see more videos like that in the future, don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss the next one. See you next time!